Hello, and welcome to another edition of B News In Depth, quarantine version. I'm your host, Rich Hosford. This month, we are bringing you updates on all things coronavirus and COVID-19. We will speak to Board of Health Chair Dr. Ed Weiner and Health Director Susan Luminello, get an update on how the situation is impacting the town from Town Administrator Paul Sagarino, take a look at how the schools have been impacted with Burlington Superintendent Eric Conti, and finally, see what's happening on the state level with State Rep Ken Gordon. We have a lot to cover, so let's get started with Dr. Weiner and Susan Luminello and our discussion on the latest news, how people can protect themselves and others, tracing the virus, and what we may expect moving forward into the summer. All right, I am now joined by Dr. Ed Weiner of the Board of Health and Health Director Susan Luminello. Thank you guys for coming on and spending some time during this strange and stressful times and joining me via Zoom, so like we everybody's doing these days. Um, so Dr. Weiner, I understand that you are interested, you know, you had, you know, wanted to start off with a, with, a, with a brief message to everybody out there about sort of the situation that we're all facing? Yeah. We are really in extraordinary times. Our town is, has been, and continues to be facing new situations and challenges almost every day. And I'm proud, however, that the Board of Health, Medical Reserve Corps, and so many others are meeting these challenges in our community. The Board of Health has been using plans that we develop and has drilled with and practiced with our MRC since 2006, years ago, and also employing some new novel and some innovative solutions of the new world. Our Board of Health staff, especially our director, Susan Luminello, who has been wonderful and so professional, our Medical Reserve Corps members continue to work every day to ensure the public safety, as have so many others, elected, appointed, our town employees, our excellent town administrator, police, fire, and many volunteers in the community. All within this state of, some, of emergency have given so much of themselves, working many hours of the day for the people of Burlington. And, and I just needed to express my thanks. So thank you for giving me that opportunity. Absolutely. I think everybody, appreciates all the hard work that is going into handling this uh, situation. Um, and, you know, to that note, just what are some of the main areas of focus that the Board of Health has had during this pandemic? Well, first you have to realize, and I think everybody does, that on top of everything that the Board of Health normally is responsible for, for instance, some things that you wouldn't expect during the pandemic, we still need to do key inspections, environmental work. We're still doing land use for development and also monitoring other communicable disease requirements. Just because we have COVID doesn't mean many other diseases have gone away. And, and I've put what we have been doing into six buckets, if you will. And we could talk an hour on each one of them. For instance, communication, providing a source of accurate information for the community, references and links. Weekly BCAT updates. I think you all know that Dr. Wayne Saltzman does a weekly update every Friday. Right. And we see, we monitor updates from the CDC. We do consultancy, advice, direction to every town department, police, fire, administration. Susan's on calls all the time. I'm on calls with our town administrator all the time. And we get so many, so many questions. Three is the coordination of services with a lot of other departments, including the Senior Center, our Medical Reserve Corps, which has been so, so helpful in helping us meet, up, meet this challenge. A lot of volunteers, even town volunteers who are not working, town, town workers, town 
employees who are not working have, have volunteered. And then we have pandemic mandates, Con contact tracing, which is a large portion of what we do, administrative reporting through services called MAVEN for the Department of Public Health. And still we have the inspections and enforcements of many businesses, giving them more education and directive and planning versus penalizing them and large future planning, what I call our SWOT analyses, successes, the weaknesses, the opportunities, the threats, and how we are going to go back to what we have had in previous to the pandemic. That's what we're working on now. Susan, I'll, I'll can, can probably speak to any of these topics. Yeah, Susan, what, what are you seeing, or what do you, you know, what do you have your people doing? What, what's sort of like the day-to-day, -day, uh, you know, over there for you? So one of the things that I, I just want to mention is the contact tracing, because people need to understand what we're doing, and we need the public's cooperation with that in order to control the pandemic. So right now, if someone becomes ill, and they go and they get tested, laboratories and doctor's offices are required to send the information to Department of Public Health, and it comes through the database called MAVEN. And the local boards of health get that information through MAVEN for the people in their community. So once you come through there and through the system, the Board of Health then begins contacting each individual and questioning and interviewing them to collect information for the Department of Public Health, but also to inform them of how they can isolate and to support them in doing that, as well as identifying who those people are that they came into contact with 48 hours before they became symptomatic. So we get the information on those people and then we collect it and then we contact each one of those people as well to make sure that they stay in quarantine. So someone is in an isolation, while they're in isolation, we are contacting them the entire time. And we are checking in on them every two or three days to make sure that they stay in isolation and that they follow the criteria required to actually be removed from isolation. So the, the Burlington Volunteer Reserve Corps has been helping us out immensely with that because as you can understand, we, we have six staff members, so it's difficult for us to do that all on our own. Mm -hmm. So in the beginning, we have had Burlington Volunteer Reserve Corps, we have about 10 nurses plus two school nurses who have been helping us out with that. And we have uh, volunteers who've been runners, giving us paperwork, delivering it back and forth. So we have been able to keep up with the requirements of isolation and quarantine for everyone who's come in because of the help of the Burlington Volunteer Reserve Corps and the two school nurses. So I, people have probably heard a lot about the contact tracing going on with the state. So what is happening there is that as of last week, we have been able to take some of our cases and move them up to the state. And we're gonna to continue to do that. So, at, so now we, we need less help from our Volunteer Reserve Corps, although they still will be helping us and we are getting more help from the state. So if you get a phone call and it says mass COVID team, please answer that phone call because that will mean either they got information on a positive test or they got information that you were in contact with someone who tested positive. Okay. I think one of the big things, you know, about this contact tracing thing is just the willingness of people to sort of cooperate with it. Are you finding that most people you get in touch with are sort of, you know, open about where they've been and what they've been doing and in providing you with the information you need? Yes, we find that most people are very cooperative and we are we also tend to be a sense of support for them. So they're most of the time they're happy to talk to us. They want they want us to help them because we have qualified people who can provide information to them. So we're not we're not having um, much of a problem with that at all. 
I think sometimes we do have a problem with contact information um, that comes up from laboratories and things like that. So sometimes it takes a little detective work to be able to get in contact with people, but um, it's been pretty successful. Excellent. And one of the challenges around that has been that if somebody works here, but doesn't live here, then we don't get the information. So we only check on, for the most part, and Susan, you can, you can expand on that because this has been an issue in the community that I get a lot of calls about. Okay. Yes, so. That's correct. So if you're a resident of Burlington, we get the information. However, if you work in Burlington and you live in another community, the information and the investigation is done by that other community. Okay. And just where do you get the sense of, you know, where we are in this? Are you getting, what's like the latest as far as numbers, as far, you know, in, from the state and in our area? So right now the numbers in Burlington are 173 cases. Okay. But that is misleading. Yes. That is the total number of people. It doesn't include those people who have gotten well, who are now well. Uh, we have no idea if there are hundreds or even more who may be carriers or asymptomatic. So the number is, is re really deceiving. Well, I understand. So, like, you know, it's difficult to say, you know, what, you know, you know, an exact number. But I was more kind of questioning, sort of, you know, do, are, do we seem to be flattening the curve, as everybody keeps talking about in, in our area? Like, how do you think Massachusetts is is doing? Is just as far as managing managing this, you know, situation. Susan, you want me to? I'll, I'll, sure, go ahead. I'll, from all the numbers we have seen, things are beginning to plateau. The number of deaths seem to be waning and, and, and decreasing. Uh, it'll take some time to see if that's an artifact or if we are actually, if we are actually out of the uh, area of danger right now. We're still in danger, but where we are, are things going down? And where are we going? I can't tell you that. Mm -hmm. uh, you want to take a look at it. Uh, if people are interested, they want to take a look at the Massachusetts General Hospital and Boston Medical Center. And Georgia Tech uh, did a recent, a recent model of both uh, Georgia and Texas. And they try to model what's going on. If we open up now, we open up later, we open up a month from now, two months from now, and what to expect. At least in that model, some people are thinking that there may be another wave. Others don't believe that. Only time will tell. It's just a model. Okay. One thing that I want to emphasize, Rich, is that, mm -hmm. so the governor has given us a date of May 18th. <laughs> We're, we're going to start to see some changes um, and what what we understand is that they're going to be phase changes but people still need to be vigilant you still need to stay six feet away from others you still need to wash your hands frequently you still need to if you if you don't need to go out don't go out so you still need to be careful about what you are doing and wearing a mask when you can't socially distance, things like that. I mean, we've all heard them, but just because we're starting to open some things up doesn't mean that we're gonna, we need to stop doing those things. Okay. And, you know, you mentioned wearing a mask and, you know, as of uh, today, the day that we're talking, um, not necessarily the day that people are gonna be seeing this, but you know, the governor's order for masks goes into effect. Any sort of best practices? And, on facial coverings? Well, there's a right way and a wrong way for facial coverage. And I heard on the radio only today that a lot of people have been seen with their face mask below their nose. I think sort of that defeats the purpose of the face mask. And, and also remember that there are certain situations when you need and must wear a face mask and situations where you may not have to wear a face mask. 
I know Susan talks a lot about this, but we're, we're hoping that we're expecting the people of Burlington to be cooperative and understand. People in this town are pretty smart. They know what they need to do. Our numbers of this town are much lower than our surrounding communities because, because they are aware. And I expect them to wear masks because it's the right thing to do. Susan, would you talk about when you don't need a mask? So the governor's order for masks is that if you should wear one indoors, if you cannot socially distance, if you go into an essential business, outdoors if you cannot socially distance but if you are outdoors and you are able to socially distance if you are walking down the street on your own and you're not coming into contact with anyone then you don't need to have your mask on however you should have a mask with you one other thing that um, people should understand if you're walking down the street and you meet your neighbor don't stop and talk you know, closer than six feet with your neighbor because your mat, the, the social distance is the best protection. So move apart and be more than six feet, feet apart and talk, but don't go right up to each other and talk just because you have the mask on is not going to provide you the type of protection that social distancing will. So we don't want masks to give people a false sense of security. That's very fair. Um, so, you know, in this day and age, of course, you know, everybody has internet access to the internet pretty much and a lot of information out there. Um, are there any particular pieces of bad or misleading information that you've been seeing about, you know, this situation that you would like to address? You know? Well, on our website is a long list of, a long list of groups that will give you good information. They range from the CDC and the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. The whole list goes down. Even, even the Massachusetts Farm Bureau, which I happen to look at their website on, a, on occasion, gives us good information. But there are lots of other websites. There are scams. And there's just some bad information out there. People believe that, in some cases, we should re be reporting on rumor. I get that every once in a while. I heard that someone at this establishment is positive. You should put that on the website. Well, we gotta be sensible here, and we gotta be professional here, and you just can't do that. So if you're looking for information, I, I urge you to, to, to get on any of these websites. You can call 211. That'll give you information that you might need. Uh, and if you're looking for a list of good, good websites, uh, good sources of information, just, just click on the Board of Health website. It's updated almost every day. Yes, I check it out. So, all right. Um, so I think we've been about 15 minutes. Is there any other, you know, big topics of, of you know, importance that you, you think we should hit on before wrapping up today? I think that Susan put it in really great perspective. When, this, when the state opens up, it's not going to open up fully. I don't think we're going to have large sporting events. I'm not sure about about graduations. I'm not sure about the theater. I'm not sure exactly what we are going to be mandated to do or not mandated to do or allowed to do. I get so much frustration even today from some people who are upset because they would like to have a large funeral or a, a, a memorial service for a loved one. Right now, we just can't do that. Hopefully, those things will come back real soon. Uh, when will life be the same? I can't tell you, only time will tell. We're in a pandemic, 
And as bad as it is, it's going to get better. We'll get through this, as I've said over and over again. We got through it in the, in the early part of the century with the Spanish flu. Nobody even remembers the millions who died during the Spanish flu. And we'll get through this. Except remember, and please remember, we have modern technology, modern antibiotics, modern drugs. Uh, and we're working, we're working to solve the solve the vaccine issue. We hear a lot coming out of out of out of the UK, out of Israel, out of the United States on on possible solutions and possible vaccines. Uh, I'm only we only can be optimistic. We'll get through this. Well, I like the optimism and hopefulness. I think that's an important message for people because. I think there's a lot of people that are very scared right now and continue to be sort of anxious most of the time. So I appreciate, I appreciate that uh, message. And I uh, appreciate you guys both taking the time to come on here and do a Zoom interview and, you know, sh you know share the, your, the information and, and insight into what's going on and how it's being handled. So I would thank you guys. Thank you both for coming on and uh, stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you. The same to you. The COVID-19 pandemic has shut down many businesses, meaning less tax income to the town. It has also forced the postponement of the Burlington Town election and the annual May Town meeting that features the passage of next year's fiscal budget. For an update on all that and how the town departments are responding to the situation, we go now to my interview with Town Administrator Paul Sagarino. Paul, well, thanks for joining me once again for another edition of B News In Depth. Uh, how is every, how's everything over there at Town Hall? Uh, not bad, Rich. Uh, I'm really encouraged uh, by what I see. You know, a lot of employees are chipping in to, to get the important, uh, most important things, duties of the town done. So, you know, it's making me really proud. Excellent. Great to hear. Um, one of the things that I wanted to talk to you first about was, you know, um, at the last Selectman's meeting, there was a report from, you know, Town Account and Assistant Town Administrator uh, John Denisio, sort of just about the impact that this is having on on tax revenue. You know, no no meals tax, no hotel, other things. So, what are we kind of looking at as far as impact to this upcoming budget, maybe even into FY twenty two? Did you say tax revenue, Rich? Yes. Uh, all right. So, so property tax revenue, where um. You know, we're $11 million below uh, what we can tax uh, for property taxes under Proposition 2.5. So, um, you know, we're moving forward with the original guidelines that were set uh, by the town. And, you know, we don't have a tax increase that's related to COVID uh, yet. Um, our, our plan and the tax, uh, the total amount of taxes assessed is, is still going according to, according to the guidelines that were set uh, back in the fall. So, at least in terms of fiscal 21, uh, there hasn't been any, any impact on the actual property taxes um, in, in terms of what we need to balance the budget. Okay. But looking ahead, what sort of, you know, impact might, you know, sort of the stalling of the economy, you know, have on town finances? Well, um, here in Burlington, our town budget is uh, very uh, dependent upon our local economy, which, you know, as, as everybody knows, is really doing extremely well. Uh, up until this situation hit. So we do um, anticipate that we will have, uh, you know, difficult decisions to make go going forward. Uh, I think what we're trying to do um, is to try to uh, have an opportunity to assess what the actual impacts are. Uh, you know, hopefully we get a reopening plan from the governor and we have a better understanding of, you know, how quickly hopefully our businesses can be back up and running and, you know, we're hopeful that um, if we may need to make some difficult decisions, we'll be able to be able to make them um, with the best information that we have available. And I think as of right now, there's just not enough information available to make to make good decisions. Right. I know one of the measures that was you know you've talked about and was discussed at um, the, that same meeting was you know we have the list of capital projects, which I understand you know are all vetted to be you know pretty essential but rather than you know have them all be a kind of start right after may or you know now june town meeting uh, maybe sort of kind of put them out throughout the year um what's sort of the you know the conversation around around that go 
Well, I think you said it well. Um, anything that made it this far is, in terms of being a capital warrant article request uh, for something um, has already waited a significant amount of time. Uh, it's already been vetted and it's something that's extremely, we consider to be very important for the town. Uh, but that said, I mean, this is a, an unprecedented situation. Uh, we, you know, we, we began to re receive feedback from uh, Board of Selectmen and, and Ways and Means Committee. And I think uh, Superintendent Conti uh, also uh, received some of that feedback from the school committee that, you know, is there a way for us to um, not move forward with some of these items in May, but delay them to a future town meeting uh, where we may have some, some better information available. So, you know, we're, we're, we're not um, operating in a vacuum here. Our, our business requires uh, feedback from our elected and appointed officials. And, you know, we like to think that we did listen uh, to what we were hearing from them. And we came back with a plan where we're gonna, you know, further delay uh, some of these projects to a future, future town meeting. And hopefully um, at that future town meeting, we'll have better information available as to the state of our economy and we can make a decision. Um, I don't think that it means that any of these projects um, are gonna drop off the list. It's just a question of when we'll be able to do them, um, you know, according to the schedule. I mean, does it get pushed back to January? Uh, does it get pushed push back to next May? If it gets pushed back to next May, it, therefore it's taken the position of another project that was sort of slated to start uh, next year. So it's just, uh, it's a delay in the pro process more than anything. Right. Um, and just your general thoughts, you know, recently uh, Governor Baker to extended the, you know, the closure of non-essential businesses uh, even further. Um, you know, just your thought, you know, on the, that's the current situation and you think like the, you know, proper decisions are being made? Well, like I say, um, everybody's dealing with a situation they never dealt with before. Um, I think we would all agree that um, the information that's come from above, uh, whether from the federal or state government has been sort of contradictory at times and, you know, may not make a lot of sense to residents and, you know, some of it doesn't make sense to us either. Uh, we're very fortunate uh, to have the Board of Health that we have here in this community. Um, they've been a rock, um, rock solid in, in terms of providing us sound guidance. Uh, we'll continue to uh, utilize, lean on them for all of our reopening decisions. Uh, in terms of what we anticipate, you know, I've been sitting in on a lot of calls <laughs> over the past month and my gut feeling with, with no inside information is that, you know, on the 18th of May, we get the report as to how to reopen the state uh, as opposed to reopen the state. That's not going to happen uh, until we start seeing uh, some declines in, in the numbers on the public health, on the hospitalizations and things of that nature, which I think are just about, you know, we're starting to roll into that time frame. But uh, in my personal opinion, on the 18th, we're going to get a document that talks about reopening in a couple of weeks or starting the process in a couple of weeks. But that's not based on any inside information. That's just sort of my gut feeling from uh, everything I've been hearing uh, from the various calls that I've been on with state uh, and other local officials. Yeah, sort of a gradual reopening is what, yep. you know, the term that I keep hearing. Um, so one thing that, you know, even if the state you know, it does open up, you know, sometime this summer. Uh, the decision has already been made to cancel the 4th of July parade. Um, guessing because, you know, so much of that preparation has to be done in advance. Uh, you know, there was talk about maybe having something later in the summer, honoring frontline workers and, you know, the graduating class of 2020. Um, any thoughts, you know, about what might be possible? So, the, I mean, the 4th of July parade is a citizen-initiated event. So right. um, there's a separate committee of citizens there. Uh, the town does provide funding for that. And I think, you know, we had that at, at the top of our list for funding uh, for this year. Uh, so it wasn't a funding issue. I think the committee had some concerns about how they were going to be able to operate their events and, uh, you know, sort of understanding that is the state going to be open by then? Uh, are the types of things that go on for the 4th of July parade going to be allowed um, at that point in time? And they made the very difficult decision to sort of uh, postpone that or cancel it this year. And again, there wasn't, there hasn't been any clear um, information provided to me, but I think Selectman Runyon had thrown out a couple of ideas. Yeah, he's very familiar with that committee and spends a lot of time working with them. Uh, that there could be potentially maybe try to pull uh, off a community event later on 
um, in, in the summer when we have some better information as to what we, what, what we could actually do at a community event at that point in time and how many people are allowed to gather and what types of, um, you know, exciting things that they could provide for the residents. So I don't have any clear definition on that. I think um, you're at, you're, you're present at the meeting as well. So I think those are some of the ideas that the committee had in right. terms of ways that we could come up with a, a great community event to sort of take the place of what would have been the 4th of July parade. And, you know, uh, how are the preparations going for the um, town election, you know, which was also postponed? And are, you know, are you encouraging people to, to you know, vote by mail, you know, try to, you know, vote in advance, kind of take advantage of those, you know, um, processes? Yep, uh, a town clerk has done a significant amount of work in this area. Um, believe it or not, there has been um, elections conducted under uh, under the current situation with the pandemic. Um, so uh, we feel as though that a, a town election could be conducted um, in a safe way for the residents. I think probably the easiest and safest way for all residents uh, would be to get you know get in touch with the town clerk's office and you know, get those ballots out and, and vote by mail. Um, the Clearly, that's an easier uh, for the residents to not have to go to the polls that day, but at the same time, you know, it cuts down on the actual foot traffic of amount of, of folks that are going to actually want to show up at the polls. So, you know, the worst thing that could happen, I think, is for a giant crowd to show up at one time at the election. I think we'll be prepared for it nonetheless, but clearly um, I think that in, in given the circumstances with the uh, crisis that's going on, uh, the fewer folks that actually show up at the polls will actually be a good thing this time, uh, as opposed to most of the time we want people to come to the, actually show up at the polls. Right. Um, I think voting by mail would be a preferable way to do it this year if a uh, resident has the ability to do so. Yes, I think that would be the wise choice. Uh, just a couple of last things, you know, so we talk, you know, a lot about how, you know, the town is adjusting to this. Are there certain initiatives that you've seen that the different department heads or different employees sort of taking to, to, you know, deal with the situation and sort of make, you know, as much, you know, keep services up or, you know, just kind of keep things flowing as much as possible? Well, it's, it's uh, you know, government's a difficult business. A lot of our work uh, is provided with citizens face to face and dealing with people on a much closer basis than over the phone and, and and, you know, a lot of our business is done in person. But, you know, that said, you know, I think it's been, we've learned a lot about, you know, providing services virtually. And I think our departments have come up with a lot of creative ways. Uh, I think there are virtual programs uh, rolled out at the Council on Aging that have been very, um, we've gotten a lot of positive feedback and emails on. I know uh, Library Director Mike Wick has done a lot of great things with uh, the virtual library. And I know that, you know, Brendan and our rec department uh, are providing, you know, as many virtual services as they can as well. So we are learning a lot about this. I think a lot of um, these things we'll learn and will, will come into play in the future in terms of how we sort of develop and deliver services to the residents. Uh, I think, again, if, if there's any positive um, of this situation is I think that we are learning a lot about, you know, new and different ways of, of the town doing business in the future. Excellent. Very good to hear. Um, last thing, I just wanted to get an update. I know that we had a few couple, a uh, few members of the Burlington Fire Department that had tested positive. Um, how's everybody doing? Uh, everybody is doing well. I, I think we have two fire, uh, positive firefighters left at this point. Uh, the previous members that were exposed uh, cleared and back to duty, uh, thankfully. And uh, my understanding is that our current members are doing well. Um, you know, health-wise, but uh, clearly are unable to participate uh, at work uh, given their circumstances. So uh, it's a it's a risk. It's a, a very risky risky job. Obviously, mm -hmm. um, I think most of most of the ambulance calls we deal with now tend to do tend to be virus related. Uh, I think uh, we're we're not getting the same types of calls to for the hospital as we used to get. Uh, almost everything now relates sort of to the virus. So. Um, it's inevitable um, if we, we are putting our firefighters in, in, you know, out there in these situations and we understand how communicable and how easy the de this uh, disease spreads that it's inevitable, unfortunately, that some of them may come in contact with it. So we're very thankful um, with uh, everybody's uh, recoveries and we're very thankful for, you know, their bravery in providing these services to our residents on a daily basis. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I hope the best for everyone over there. Um, so that's everything that I had. I appreciate you taking some time out of your day to, to do another Zoom uh, interview with me. <laughs> Hopefully sometime, not too long, we'll be able to do them in person again. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. And uh, thank you and BCAT for getting out a lot of the information uh, out to the community. And, and, you know, thank you to uh, the majority of our residents have been extremely understanding about, you know, different changes to the level of services and different restrictions uh, that the towns had to put in place. Um, I think we finally got some good news back on the trash that um, right. the overflow bags are going to start getting picked up soon. And there's a plan in place to resume with the, the um, yard waste and things of that nature. So again, just uh, very, very thankful to the citizens and the way that they've, um, um, you know, worked with us through this difficult time. All right. Excellent. Well, thank you again and stay, stay healthy and safe. With schools closed for the rest of the academic year and even next fall in question for regular classes, there is a lot up in the air for the school department. Add to that a desire to acknowledge the class of 2020 graduation in some way and to formally mark the end of the school year for students. To discuss all that, I spoke with Burlington Public Schools Superintendent Eric Conti. Let's take a look. Superintendent Conti, thank you for taking some time once again to talk to us here through video conference. Okay. Um, since the last time we spoke, you know, last time it was possibly May 4th was going to be reopening. Now, of course, this, till the end of the school year is, is closed. What kind of adjustments had to be made on, on your end, um, you know, after that the decision came out from the state? Um, well, we were actually happy the decision came all at once and they didn't give us another couple weeks and then another couple weeks after that. So I think when we were able to adjust, we knew we were working towards uh, the end of the school year. Um, I think the state also, when the decision to come to close came about, um, it was only a couple days later that the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education um, released guidelines for the remainder of that time. So they're, they're calling this now phase three um, of the school closure. And so we've taken the last um, week or so and we've responded we've adjusted our plans to align with the state's sort of phase three um the phase three guidelines and we're implementing those um for the remainder of the year okay and that turns and ties into like the plans for remote learning and things like that it does so you know i think um phase one was just sort of again, responding to the you know, the, the, the closure. Um, phase two talked about uh, connecting with students and really reinforcing um, content that we had already taught. And uh, the phase three, sort of through the end of the year, uh, the department has identified what they're calling power standards. So sort of essential knowledge that they wanna make sure kids have before they um, move on to the next grade. So our objective is really to prepare kids for the for the next grade. So that indicated to all of us that there weren't going to be sort of mass retentions or changes happening at the state level. Um, it was a clear indication that the state wants us to try to incorporate some new content into um, what we're doing remotely. Um, and then our teachers um, had to make some adjustments uh, to those to those new guidelines. And I think people have been doing uh, phenomenally well in terms of making those adjustments. And so, um, and what I should have started with, uh, Rich, was was gratitude. It is Teacher Appreciation Week. So sure. I just want to make sure we are uh, um, expressing gratitude to all the work they're doing. They're working incredibly hard and um, they're really uh, meeting all the expectations that we're setting for them. So, um, so again, I, I couldn't be prouder of the staff right now. And what are you hearing from, you know, are you hearing from students about how they're sort of adjusting to remote learning or from the teachers about how their students are expressing kind of how they, what they're thinking about how things are going? We have a, it's, we have a, again, a very, a very varied um, responses to it. So, um, you know, and, and all of this is anecdotal. We, we are gathering some data through who's accessing things but I can't tell you this is a really analytical um, analysis, but we probably have um, about 50% of our students participating regularly um, 
in the remote learning activities. Um, and um, you might think that's a, a low number or you might think that's a high number. Again, it's, it's a relative number. Um, I think we have um, times when we have more kids participating and we have times when there are fewer students participating. Um, in some of the parent feedback we've received, we probably have about 25% of our families roughly who want to see more content. Um, we have 25% of our families who are completely overwhelmed, who um, don't want, who want school basically to end. And we probably have about 50% of families in the middle who are, um, you know, who are using the materials and really trying to do the best that they can. Um, every family has a different situation. Some are dealing with tragic losses. Some are managing um, multiple kids. Some are managing um, a, a career at the same time. Um, so we're really trying to be sensitive to both our teachers who have their own lives um, and work, and then our families who also have their own lives and work. So it's a, it's a, it's a challenge. Yeah, absolutely. Now, it was for, uh, a decision by the state that all students are going to progress to the next grade, correct? Um, again, I, they, didn't, they didn't come out and say that all students were going to progress, but I think what they were telling us is for phase three, which was really from um, – uh, I think it was last Friday when the guidelines were released that um, they identified some new content for us to um, deliver to students to prepare them for their next year. So they didn't say every kid was going to advance, I mean, be promoted, but I think they, they set a tone that they want us to be preparing students for the next year. Okay. And how are, you know, I know last time we talked, we talked about, um, plans for some kind of graduation and other sort of like, you know, marking of transitions for different students. Um, how are things coming along? Um, I think there's a lot of planning going on. So uh, Mark Sullivan, high school principal, uh, some of his administrative leadership team are putting together some proposals. I think we're looking at those. We want to share those with um, other departments across town, uh, Park and Rec, Brendan and I, Brendan and I have, have spoken and uh, he, you know, he wants to make sure if we're using the field that they have enough time to prepare. Um, so th there's lots of communication happening. I think we also need to include the Board of Health to make sure that our plans sort of meet their expectations locally. And um, so we're working through all that. So I, I don't really have a, um, a set plan to announce tonight. Um, but Rich went as soon as we're done and we have sort of all of our approvals, I'm sure Mark will be um, communicating that to all of his senior families and we'll make sure that we get that you that information um, as soon as we have it. Oh, great. We uh, definitely will get the word out as well. Um, so right now, you know, a lot of things are still up in the air, but is there a lot of discussion about the fall? Like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's lots of conversations about the fall, but um, no, no decisions or determinations yet. So um, um, we're, we're sort of planning um, multiple ways of, of trying to open school. So um, if school does open um, completely, then um, we'll um, – um, we still are going to have to make some adjustments because kids would have been out of school for about six months. Um, we might have to uh, address some of the, um, we're going to have to um, determine um, where they are in terms of what content they have, what, what they've retained. Um, so we're going to have to make a lot of adjustments. Um, and so just from the school side of things, the, the uh, academic side, the teaching side of things, we're going to have to make some adjustments, even if we were to open up completely and have complete flexibility, uh, complete freedom to operate however we want it. Um, so that's one scenario. Another scenario might be that we need to make some uh, adjustments based on um, um, more COVID-related uh, closures. So there's talk of... Um, so how do we, how do we incorporate social distancing in school, whether that's even possible? Um, there are some conversations about uh, do all kids report um, every day? Do we, in order to keep distance, do we have some kids report some days and other kids report other days? There, there's all these models being discussed, but uh, we don't really know what the decisions are going to be. 
We do know that the governor is working on a plan to sort of gradually reopen the state. And I think he's going to be uh, releasing some information on uh, May 18th. And so we're looking forward to seeing sort of what, what that is. Um, our summer school experiences right now, our extended school year, um, we're still looking at doing our summer programs uh, remotely if, if they occur, because we haven't heard that we can um, bring, bring uh, children together yet safely. Right. Um, speaking of having kids in the schools, is there going to be an opportunity? Because, you know, this happens so fast. Um, you know, school, especially in the high school, probably the middle school as well, kids have stuff in lockers and, you know, things they probably left behind. Will there be any opportunities or is there any planning for, you know, having them be able to come in and access that kind of stuff? Yeah, we probably wouldn't have them come into the buildings. What we would probably do is uh, take the contents of a locker, uh, put it in a bag, uh, label the bag, and then have opportunities for parents to come by and, and, and pick it up in a sort of in a safe way, in a remote way. So um, we are talking about that. Teachers are saying um, they didn't get a chance to clean up their classrooms. So again, whether that can occur um, before the end of the school year, during the summer, or even as a part of our fall opening, we, we still have yet to make that determination. Okay, so a lot of things still up in the air. Of course. Uh, right. And I feel like I'm restating lots of problems, but not offering any solutions yet. And, and I, I understand that. Yeah. And I think that that's for everybody. <laughs> Nobody knows what really what's what's going on. Um, any other sort of, you know, big decisions that are being made right now as far as, you know. Um, we're actually trying to um, minimize the, the changes for the rest of the time school is open till, till June 19th. So we want to, um, we're releasing our phase three remote learning plans. Um, we really, we want those plans to be in place and we really, we, again, the content will change, but we really don't want to change any of the sort of instructional um, structure uh, until school closes. So I think we're doing that. We're talking about the end of year. Um, we do want to make sure that we we don't just say remote learning stops June nineteenth. We want to make sure there's some sort of closing activities so students and teachers know that the year sort of has ended. We had um, we're missing out on a lot of those closures. I mean, the seniors are the are the most drastic example, but we had other closure activities for fifth graders and eighth graders. Um, you know, those are big transitional years, and really the end of year for all students is is a, is a transition. So we, we're talking about how to um, how to plan sort of that year end. But we're not gonna be, I think, making any major instructional uh, changes. And then most of our time is gonna be in planning for the fall opening and do we need um, different types of materials? Do we send, um, do we need um, masks? Um, how much hand sanitizer? I mean, again, Rich, there's, there's so many um, variables to this that we're really trying to, um, um, make sure that we are covering lots of ground. We're talking to our neighbors a lot, so we're not doing this uh, in isolation where we talk a lot as a, as a league, so the 12 surrounding communities that, uh, that are providing schools. So my colleagues have been incredibly helpful in terms of talking through what are you doing for graduation and, and things like that because we're always compared and, and we wanna make sure that we're sharing good ideas. We're even looking at doing some bulk purchasing for um, for materials and things like that. So um, the collaboration that I've seen both at the teacher level, at the administrative level uh, within the district, and I also have to say the collaboration that, that I've been participating in with my colleagues um, between districts has really been phenomenal. And, and if there's any good that comes out of this um, health crisis is that uh, people are really working together well. Excellent, good to hear. And uh, I'm sure that as time goes on and you know more of these decisions are made, we'll be able to reconnect and have other, uh, future updates throughout the throughout the summer and into the fall. So yes, well, I appreciate you taking some time, uh, coming on and sharing you know what you can share, and I hope that you continue to stay healthy and safe. Oh, I will, and you as well. And as, as I we talked about at the beginning, I'm I'm hoping at some point to figure out like a haircut or something for these for these video chats. So I'm always very self-conscious, but uh, I think uh, the, the information is important. So thank you for all doing the work that you guys are doing as well. So thank you. Well, absolutely. And yes, barbershops are going to be booming as soon as this thing is over. <laughs> all right. Take care. You as well. Thank you.
Finally, this month, we go to an interview with State Rep Ken Gordon about what is being done at the state level in response to the pandemic and the subsequent challenges it poses to business, people's employment, and local governments. Let's check it out. All right. Uh, thank you for joining us, State Rep Ken Gordon. I hope you are doing well in these strange times. I am, uh, Rich, and thank you for having me on. And uh, my same uh, thoughts are out to you and Joy. I hope you guys are doing okay. Yeah, we are. Uh, you know, as you can see, working from home, so trying to stay safe. Um, so, no, you got a haircut, and I couldn't find one. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good to have a wife with skills. Yeah. Um, so, one of the things you know, I want to start off with is just you know, as you can see, obviously, we're doing a Zoom interview for the first time. What's sort of the you know the workflow, or you know, at the state house? How are how have things you know sort of adjusted to all this? Well, like a lot of other businesses and a lot of other people, um, we're having a lot of work going on through video conferences and various formats, a few on the traditional telephone conference calls, but several times as we're, um, a day, we're going from one conference call to the other, um, meeting with each other that way to, um, to collaborate on work. Um, and then we've got a lot of work coming in from constituents who are having issues with things like unemployment because we have a whole new system of the pandemic unemployment program as well as um, some frustration with the traditional unemployment program so folks have been calling in with questions and I think we've been pretty successful at resolving them so the folks watching this if you're having issues with your unemployment application please um, you know don't give up call our office and we may be able to help yeah, I was going to ask what you've been hearing from, you know, constituents. Is unemployment the big, the biggest issue? Are you hearing other, you know, concerns or, you know, um, issues that people are having? Yeah, we're getting five to 20 unemployment questions a day, um, a lot. And, and, I, and I do think a lot of it is because the administration, um, quite rightly, has um, expanded. Um, and, and that's a great thing. Um, and the governor talks in his daily briefings about going from 50 up to first it was 400 and now it's even more than that. But these are all new people. And I think they've been trained very quickly and, you know, through no fault of their own. Sometimes um, there needs to be somebody that can look at the details of a person's claim. And so that's where we come in. And I think we've been able to help to do that. So that's the biggest thing. And then it, while it's not a state level issue, we've had a lot of business owners call with frustrations about the payroll protection plan, the first phase of it. It started right. again yesterday. We had Congressman Moulton on the Wrapping with the Rep show, and I'm going to have him back, um, or, or we're making arrangements to have him back again to talk about this latest PPP iteration, and hopefully we'll have a better um, rollout of that. Yeah, um, you know, there's a lot of talk about trying to make sure that actual, you know, small businesses receive more of the funds this time than the first round. So hopefully, you know, that works right. out. Um, since we are on the subject of unemployment, one of the things that was recently passed uh, at the state level was an expansion of who's eligible. Can you talk about uh, how that kind of works? Yeah, uh, through the CARES Act, we created uh, our version of, um, of the pandemic unemployment plan. And what that means is that traditionally unemployment involves people who get a W-2 at the end of the tax year, they work for someone else, uh, and so their employer uh, through and through their own uh, payment and through payroll deduction, they pay a premium to the un unemployment insurance um, uh, uh, agencies. And when someone loses their job um, under certain circumstances, they're eligible. Well, there are a lot of people um, who work in Massachusetts through the gig economy or other types of self-employed people, and they were never part of the system. Under normal times, that's a a risk that they took and um, and if they switch jobs they would they would have a, make a different plan but now because so many people have lost their employment opportunities all at once we've created this new system which gives basically the same benefit as traditional un unemployment just new rules including the extra six hundred dollars a week that came under the cares act right so people you know who hadn't been able to get unemployment before now can right. um, probably something, you know, necessary in these, in these times. Um, so, you know, just 
yesterday, um, you know, Governor Baker, you know, made the announcement that he was extending the, you know, the stay at home advisory and the closure of non-essential businesses, you know, to um, May 18th, I believe. Right. Um, what are your thoughts on, uh, on that decision? Well, I think that what we've shown is we've, we've seen real success with our plan of social distancing, of washing, of um, staying home, uh, except to go out for the things that we need. We're not trapped in our homes. We can get in the car and, and go somewhere, certainly to the grocery stores and take out at restaurants and other things. But there are other, also other businesses that involve real essential uh, and, and very close person-to-person -person contact that the governor ordered closed. At this point, we've reached the surge of the pandemic. We've, we were, we're seeing uh, the, the number of people that has, you know, it's reached a point where it's plateauing, so it's not growing, but it's not coming down either. And the experts tell us that until it starts to come down for a couple of weeks, we shouldn't be looking at going back to the way um, we were or just taking steps to get into that direction. Because the problem is we want to avoid a second surge. Um, if there's a second surge, it will be worse than the first. And we just, we've worked hard to get control. Um, we haven't seen a, uh, a situation. I'm, I'm really getting concerned about your fish. Um, <laughs> yeah, you, it's a closed system, so the cat can't get in there. <laughs> all right. I was going to, my heart was going out to a couple of those tetras or what have you. But in any case, so, um, so yeah, when the time is right, I think that uh, we'll be um, folding back in our, our, uh, uh, our economic system, our commerce, so things will start opening up again. But uh, I'm having a good time watching that cat. <laughs> but, uh, but I just don't think we're there yet. It'll come soon. Right. Um, so one of the, you know, the big, you know, things that people are having to adjust to is the closing of schools um, and childcare facilities. Right. Um, what do you think, what do you see sort of like the state's role is ensuring that, you know, you know, educational opportunities continue? Well, first of all, as you know, the schools are closed now for the rest of the school year. Right. Uh, and so the demand for the, well, so there continues to be a demand for childcare because people who are still working during the day still have to keep track of their children. Like you're keeping track of your cat, but no, I didn't <laughs> just, but people are still, you know, you still have that. So it's still important. And we still got to look for ways to reopen some of the daycares when it's safe to do so. Um, like some of the other uh, businesses that we have. So, um, so we'll, we'll get to that. We'll do that. Um, and certainly when school opens again, we've, we've got to do that. Absolutely. Um, when, you know, so just going through some of the other, you know, things that have come out from the state level, a moratorium on evictions and foreclosures, uh, just talk about the importance of, you know, that because so many people are sort of struggling to either pay rent or pay their mortgages. Yeah, it's a real basic right. There are some things that happen as a consequence of this pandemic that we can address, things that we can address through money, through unemployment and all. We can, we can replace some of the wages that people are losing. We've got to do it efficiently and effectively, but we can do that. But other things you just can't. Um, so if someone loses their home at a time where we want people to stay home, how can we replace that? Um, it's, it's just fundamentally important that people be allowed to, to stay home and that we protect their rights to be home. And so they're still going to owe the rent. Uh, the landlord still has a right to get it, but they just may have to have an arrangement for a month or two of rent to be paid back over time. Uh, and the banks certainly have to address this as well. It's in their interest to make sure that, for example, a commercial landlord, a landlord that's renting out to someone, um, they may have to use the rent money to pay their mortgage the banks have to be part of the solution too. Um, and, and, you know, from what I'm hearing is people have been able to make arrangements and, and hopefully that'll continue. And there's also was a, a bill kind of focused on the people on the front lines, liability protection for healthcare workers. Can you sort of talk about how that, what that entails and, you know, you know, why it was necessary? Yeah, well, that was passed into law as well. It's like the last one you mentioned. And the reason is that people are now working outside of, their physical comfort zone. People are going into um, working in places like tents or the convention center. Um, thankfully, because we were able to control this surge, the use of these facilities wasn't as great as we 
planned for them to be uh, in case we needed it. So that works out. But still, um, there were many healthcare people who were very concerned that if something happens uh, in the course of this pandemic, um, they just don't want to be held personally liable. So uh, some nurses and doctors are, are coming to us saying, you know, as a result of um, our inability to rely on traditional room, you know, the traditional um, infrastructure that they have, right. the rooms and all that, they just don't have it right now. So they've been, they've got to be able to get out there and work. And the last thing is just, you know, what else, you know, do you see, you know, what's in the works right now or what do you think might be sort of necessary in the future moving forward as, you know, we sort of, you know, continue through this situation? Well, we're looking at several bills to continue to help people. For example, um, we've got to look at ways to help um, people that uh, contract the virus in the course of their job and you know, what happens then? Do they, someone gets sick at work? First of all, do they have to prove that where they got sick was at work? So if you have a healthcare worker who, who tests positive and then becomes symptomatic, they have to leave work. They're quarantined, right? Do they have to prove I got this at work? Can the employer say, hey, wait a minute, there's someone in your home that tested positive. Maybe you got it from them. So, um, so I've considered, in fact, I've talked to the speaker about legislation. He just said, we, 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 we could do this um, together, but it would be to protect workers like that. So first of all, it's presumed that you got it from work. You're, you're caring for patients that have the condition. And then second of all, you don't have to use all of your earned sick time uh, or your vacation time to be, uh, to, to have wage replacement, you can, you know, traditionally we have things like workers comp when you're injured on the job, but well, wouldn't this be the same thing as being injured on the job? So we're looking at that. Um, and then, you know, other ways that we can help currently our healthcare system um, so that this stress is manageable. And, and, and then, you know, uh, and then our, our local economy. Well, it seems like there's a, a lot to do, a lot to consider, and I hope you are able to, you know, stay healthy and, and continue pl uh, you know, f forging forward. Well, one thing that we're also looking at doing, and hopefully we're within a day or two of doing, is coming up with a way that we can meet in formal session. Um, because up until now, these laws were passed in what we call informal session, which is that we reach consensus. With, with everybody in the legislature. And once we all can agree to something, then we can move it forward. Because if any one member objects to it, it's got to stop right there. Um, it, it's, it's certainly the art of compromise, uh, but we can't debate and we can't pass something that doesn't have unanimous support. So what we talked about doing is a way in which by using both video streaming and the traditional telephone to be able to conduct debates to watch the debates, watch each other on a video, and then to um, vote by uh, essentially instructing someone over the phone to push the, the yes button or the no button. And it's being, um, the, I think we're in the final stages now of being able to do it, and hopefully by the end of the week or next week, we'll be able to vote that way. Well, it's, it will be interesting to see how that works, and I hope it does. So, uh, but as for right now, I just wanted to Thank you for taking some time to, you know, video conference, come in, uh, you know, zoom in and talk to us and our viewers. And I hope that you, you and your family are able to stay safe and healthy during, during this time. Thank you, Rich. And my best to, to you, to Joy, and to everybody at BCAT. Same thing. Let's uh, work together because, you know, together we'll get through this. So there you have it, an update on the coronavirus COVID-19 pandemic in terms of the local health response, the impact on the municipal government, what's happening with the school department, and actions being taken at the state level. I'd like to thank my guest, Board of Health Chair at Dr. Ed Weiner, Health Director Susan Lumanello, Town Administrator Paul Sagarino, Superintendent Eric Conti, and State Rep Ken Gordon. I'd also like to thank all of you for watching. We'll be back with another edition of B News In Depth next month, either in studio or remotely. So stay tuned.